So here's just a quick update on some of the political highlights that interest me and hopefully you in Washington state. And I want to discuss the recent referendum effort to repeal Bill 5599, the failures, the lessons, the path forward. And I also plan to basically touch bases on the early jostling for the governor's race that happens next year, but big changes since we actually discussed this race recently. Now, first, let's uh, rip the Band-Aid off and just address the very disappointing failures of the R101 effort to secure enough signatures to submit them to the Secretary of State last, it's actually uh, two Saturdays ago. According to the sponsors, they were actually able to obtain 157,000 signatures in a couple of weeks, but this was short the necessary 162,000. So they were basically short about 5,000 signatures to submit, but really they needed another 40,000 signatures just to be safe. This was close, but it's not enough to submit. So the sponsors of the referendum sent out an email to this effect actually a couple weeks ago. Now, Seattle journalist Jonathan Cho basically captured the moment where the Alphabet Soup group, kind of led by this weirdo state senator Marco Leas, he's a politician that I've caught breaking the law a few years ago, of course, and he seems to like to break it a lot. And he was celebrating the failure of the referendum to protect children at the Gay Pride Parade in Arlington. This is just a number of days ago. Now, I'll link to it below for you to watch for yourself, and it's worth knowing who celebrates the harm that they plan to inflict on children. Now remember, a referendum has 90 days from the end of session to turn in enough signatures, which essentially means the supporters usually only have truly about 60 to maybe 45 days, just from a practical standpoint, to submit these to Secretary of State for signature validation. And keep in mind, this is a very different deadline than the initiatives to the legislature, which are still in play. And they don't have a due date for submission until later in the year, actually in late December. So obviously there's a lot of blowback against the legislature entirely directed at the Democrats, like Mark Elias, who almost universally appear to want to hurt children and keep the harm that they plan to inflict on kids a secret from their parents. SB 5599 was a bill signed by Governor Inslee, which generated significant national attention and not the good attention, but the disgust was most felt by parents of children in this state, and the effort to collect the signatures was driven by this disgust with Inslee, and the supporters of this effort to basically harm children and encouraged by the strange kind of weird approach that the state Dems have taken to encourage third-party organizations to essentially kidnap children without their parents' knowledge and to keep the location of those children concealed from not just the parents, but also law enforcement and others. These organizations could only do this if they could inflict life-changing surgery and pharmaceutical intervention on the kidnapped kids, which was all done, of course, to placate special interests who hope to prosper from this type of harmful activity. However, for an all-volunteer effort at the last minute, this was an impressive effort, but there are some lessons learned, and I'll point out that this momentum is carrying forward now in some initiative success that I hope that we see for the end of the year. Now, one thing I'll point out is that this effort to collect signatures was done for the most part in just a few weeks' time, collecting signatures at churches, and that was impressive by itself. But some of the churches kind of dithered for weeks, deciding if they would engage in this effort or not. And it's not so much because they had any doubt about the absurdity of the proposed policy in the original bill, but because they were kind of concerned about whether the church should provide a forum to assist in this effort. And some decided to kind of cower in fear before the state, but many engaged and supported the effort. The challenge, of course, is that, that how much time actually was lost while well, these churches kind of wasted this critical time making a decision. So judging from the pace of signature gathering, another week or two of collecting signatures at the volume that they were being collected is actually probably all they needed to get over the top. So I will point out that this was a surprisingly wide spectrum of religious organizations that joined together in this one. This includes many Protestant and Catholic churches, as well as many mosques and Sikh temples, just to identify a few. I suspect that this type of cooperation between people of many different faiths is likely to grow in the near future as a state controlled by the Democrats right now appears determined to break up families and harm children with any excuse that they can invent. People who care about their children do not support this type of behavior, but the Democrats appear completely unconcerned and more focused on supporting the special interests behind the alphabet soup pronoun people. So now the strong surge in support for the referendum, well, it failed to get R101 across the finish line in time. Many people were also signing the complimentary parental uh, notification initiative, I-2081, which is the first Let's Go Washington initiative that was launched earlier this year. 
So the surge of signatures is actually a good sign of future successful submission of this initiative to the state, but it will continue to take months of signatures gathering all of the state to be certain of hitting that 400,000 signature goal, which they have. Now, I've recorded a series of interviews with Brian Haywood two weeks ago, and I posted most of them last week. And Brian here actually uh, discusses the various initiatives that he and others have come together to organize to fix what is broken in Washington State. And I'll let him tell you in his own words about them. So go back and watch those videos on this channel. You can see them linked down below for those interviews. Now, before I move into a discussion of the governor's race, I just want to remind you that if you like this video and the work that I do, don't forget to hit subscribe, like, and share down below. Make sure you share them with others. Uh, while I'm fully aware of the shadow banning efforts to silence me and kind of limit the research and the reach that I have, it makes it easier for me to expand the reach of this channel if more people watch these videos. So you can also go to the links in the video description area below if you want to subscribe to my email newsletter from my website or if you just want to financially support my efforts. You can help me push back against the effort to stop me by just sharing this video as far and wide as you can. Now let's talk about next year's governor race and the jockeying around and early updates on this race. So keep in mind, nobody should forget to complete their ballot or ballots plural if you live in King County or at a homeless camp somewhere and make sure that you vote for the local races this fall. I'm actually filming this video right now on primary day, so by the time you will see this, it'll be too late to backfill your ballots unless you work inside the King County Elections Department, in which case you can just discover them in your trunk. Now, these really these local school boards, city council, and other local races, they matter quite a bit more often, and they matter a lot more than I think people realize. And there's no reason to hold back. I mean, remember, off-year elections tend to have much lower participation, which actually makes your ballot count more. So if you live in King County and you have a dozen ballots or more, it really weights your voting even more. They really should only count one of them. Now, if you have died sometime in the last decade and your ballot is still coming, don't worry. Nobody has ever prosecuted dead people for voting in Washington State. And the current Secretary of State appears to be friendly to dead people. So just don't forget to vote, even after death. And I know it's summer and the weather's nice, but don't forget to vote this fall. November comes up quickly. Now, anyway, back to next year's governor race. The biggest change that has happened since we last discussed this race for next year is really the people who have officially announced or dropped out of the race. Now, I will point out, if you look up this position right now in the Public Disclosure Commission website, you're going to see approximately 24 people that have filed to run for this office. Presuming that Inslee does indeed step down, as he has indicated that he will do, and including the people who are not serious about their campaigns, in other words, they're not raising money or spending anything to actually try to win a statewide office. So this really just leaves us with a handful of candidates who are currently active in the race. The three leading uh, Democrats are A.G. Bob Ferguson, Public Lands Commissioner Hillary Franz, and State Senator Mark Mullet from the 5th Legislative District. That's actually in Issaquah. Now, I've discussed all these guys before, but Ferguson is clearly in the catbird seat due to his fundraising haul of over $3 million. Mark Mullet is technically in second place, cash-wise anyway, with half a million in the campaign finance bank. And then Franz is kind of pulling up the rear with a paltry $250,000. On the Democratic Party side of things, this only tells part of the story, of course. Ferguson needs a massive amount of money to overcome the general disgust the public has for him. His unlikable quotient's very high. In fact, the more you know him, the more you dislike the guy. So the survey data clearly doesn't make him look better, and he may not be able to bribe or threaten enough people or special interests in the state to just easily waltz into the governor's mansion. So Hil Hillary Franz, as public lands commissioner, is really not a good person, but she does a pretty good job putting on a facade of being nice and personable sometimes. And to her credit, she has not been afraid to confront Ferguson far more aggressively than many people realized. Her efforts to sabotage some of Ferguson's fundraising efforts, that's been impressive to observe. Senator Mark Mullet uh, mostly is actually just running because the Democratic Party stabbed him in the back last election cycle. I mean, he understands math, and he has a small business, which is really an automatic disqualifier for Democrats today, and the King County Democrats are certainly out to destroy him and his political future. I suspect this is his kind of final political charge, and he is a bit understandably bitter about Inslee's clearly stabbing him in the back during the last election cycle. 
Now, my last comments about the Democratic Party field is that I don't see any other realistic challengers jumping into this race. Of the three, Ferguson is best understood as the modern manifestation of kind of this mythical antichrist, uh, right? A, a vacant person with no soul, having sold it long ago for this pathetic shot at the crown. There is no law he won't break and nobody he won't bury to get there. So if you care about freedom, liberty, and the future of your community, babies or little children, you would crawl over broken glass to vote against this corrupt guy. Franz is probably second worst in this mix, and I'm not sure the universe is actually large enough to hold her ego, but she is smart enough to know that lying to people and pretending to be normal is better than just being openly evil. If she became governor, she would give away the state and our future to a variety of special interests on the green side of the equation, but she might try to be semi-normal compared to Ferguson. And that's a big maybe, but better than absolutely nuts like Ferguson. Senator Mullet is a good man. I disagree completely with him on most of his social policy positions, and his weakness in kind of caving to the left on those issues was clearly not reciprocated by their enduring support. This is a common mistake made by normal Democrats who think that they can compromise their sanity to cater to the left. It never worked for long. The first chance the left had, of course, they stabbed Mark Mullet in the back. So now if for some reason he could thread the election needle, he would probably be no friend to the backstabbers. However, he isn't obviously conservative enough or well-known enough to cater to the Republicans. And mostly it is a lobby world kind of group that has supported him thus far. The Republican field, on the other hand, for governor, has settled down into just a few options, which, by the way, is not a bad thing because Republicans have tended to flood the zone. But in this case, former uh, candidate Raul Garcia officially dropped out of the race just a few weeks ago. Now, this was mainly because Dave Reichert here, former 8th Congressional District Congressman and former King County Sheriff, known as the guy who helped catch the Green River murderer, now that he jumped into the race. Garcia shifting his political ambitions to the federal Senate seat was actually a wise move, but this essentially just leaves two Republican candidates in this race, Sammy Byrd, who we've actually discussed before, and newly declared candidate Dave Reichert. Now, frankly, Reichert's entry into this race probably hurts nobody more than Democrat State Senator Mark Mullet, because most of the traditional lobbyists and political insiders who were kind of shifting towards Mullet are likely to just switch their support back to Reichert, who has been hanging kind of in the background of the handful of retired Republican politicians in the state, just kind of waiting for his crack at a statewide office. Reichert felt that the race had opened up because Pierce County Executive Bruce Danmeyer formally said he would not run, and a few other theoretical Republican uh, prospects also dropped out for various reasons. And when Representative Jim Walsh finally indicated that he would put his hat in the ring to become the next chair of the Washington State Republican Party and not run for governor, Reichert decided this was his chance. So with Reichert in the race, I see Mullet's campaign floundering because he will run out of money. The Democrats are trying to stab Mark in the back, and any Republican supporters that Mark had in his camp are perfectly willing to vote for Reichert just as easily. Now, on the other hand, I suspect the Reichert campaign will elevate Sammy Byrd's campaign at the same time. Byrd's unofficial campaign slogan, Give Olympia the Bird, will resonate with the more conservative factions of the state. And his resume and strong efforts around the state, because uh, he's really at most political events wherever I go now and I travel a lot, this seems to connect to a growing grassroots coalition that's organizing behind him. So if I were to make a prediction with the information that we have right now in this race, I don't anticipate either Byrd or Reichert going very negative on each other which probably bodes well for the Republican prospects in this race. We all know that this race is a stretch for Republicans to win right now because the Republicans are not really organized to win a statewide race and the various factions within the Republican Party kind of think it's basically smart to spend most of their time and energy attacking each other rather than the Democrats. We see this all the time where liberal-leaning Republicans won't vote for more conservative Republicans and vice versa. Is this self-destructive? Sure it is. If it is particularly, actually, when you have a cloud of darkness and evil like Ferguson looming on the horizon, but it's not easy to convince people to stop self-immolating when they're bound and determined to do so. So for anyone who wants to follow the early days of this race, which is still a year away from the primary election, this is how I believe things essentially are stacking up right now. Things can change. For those who want uh, to do something and have an impact right now this year, I'm going to close here just with a few suggestions. Number one, 
collect as many of the initiative signature sheets as you can and go collect the signatures for all six initiative with Let's Go Washington. I mean, we need to learn how to make this process work anyway. And if we can have success getting these on the ballot, we can start to fix what's broken in the state. And I think it's a great use of time. Number two, there are elections for school board members, city councils, and other local races right now. So help a local candidate near you get elected. This is excellent experience if you want to help next year in the larger election campaigns throughout the state. And you can make a real difference where you live. And finally, engage with other like-minded people where you live and convince them to help you in your efforts to make a difference. There is strength in numbers, and you never know what friends you're going to meet when you engage. Because in the end, you need to show up to have an impact, and the future is only going to belong to those who show up.